The dawn of AMD's Threadripper CPUs has given many creative professionals the opportunity to be a lot more productive with their workflow without breaking the bank. If AMD did something right last year, it was the Zen architecture because these processors are absolute workhorses and the value is pretty incredible. And so along with this fresh architecture was the birth of the X399 chipset and several motherboards to choose from. Now a typical buying strategy when choosing parts for your new rig, whether that's a gaming system or a workstation, is to spend less money on the parts that aren't going to affect your performance significantly, like your power supply, case and motherboard, and then prioritize your spending on the parts that do matter more, like your CPU and graphics card. Today we're checking out a motherboard that allows you to do just that. It's one of the cheapest X399 motherboards out there going for just 319 US dollars and that money saved could potentially be used to get your hands on the top tier Threadripper part, the 1950X. This is the CPU that all X399 builders have their eyes on, a 16 core 32 thread beast capable of tearing through any multi-threaded workload you can throw at it. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not the X399 SLI Plus can handle all of that power. Now, being one of the cheapest X399 boards out there, you'd be quick to think that you'd be compromising on quality parts, but MSI's goal here was a board that gets the job done without a lot of the excess trimmings. Overall, the board looks fairly clean with an all black finish and tasteful design. The only RGB on the board is on the IO shroud, the chipset heatsink, and underneath the bottom right hand side of the board, which is all programmable through the Mystic Light software. And this does add some nice color to the board without stretching it too far into the game aesthetic. On to more important talking points though, we're getting 13 VRM phases in total using military class components such as titanium chokes and dark capacitors, and of that we're getting 10 VRM phases for the CPU, which is achieved through 5 true phases which are then doubled, and we'll take a look at the temperatures a little bit later. And on that note, I do appreciate that the CPU VRM heatsinks are actually heatsinks and not just metal blocks that we see on some of the other boards. Here we're actually getting functional fin stacks which do a great job of dissipating that heat. It's pretty common to see dual 8-pin power connectors for the CPU on these X399 boards and the SLI Plus is no exception, but something that I was not expecting was an extra power connector for your PCI Express devices, but don't worry because that is completely optional. Now, being the SLI Plus, we are of course getting support for Nvidia's SLI in full force here with up to a 4-way configuration. And there's also support for AMD's Crossfire as well, with also up to four cards supported. And although optimization and support for SLI is slowly fading away, you could definitely utilize all of those PCI Express slots for a powerful workstation setup. For M.2 storage, we've got support for up to three slots here, with the top slot featuring an M.2 thermal shield that we've looked at previously. And with the X399 boards being so dense, there's not many other places you could put these M.2 slots, but if you're looking for the best thermal performance, I would recommend that you use one of the two bottom slots which would be away from your graphics cards. SATA storage is plenty too, 8 ports in total with a stack of 6 at a right angle to the board which we always love to see. Now Threadripper allows for that quad channel memory so we've got support for that here as well for up to 128GB of DDR4 memory running across all 8 DIMMs with speeds of up to 3600MHz and if you want to check compatibility before buying then I highly recommend that you go and check out the list in the description. And keep in mind that compatibility will depend on your CPU clock speeds as well so just keep that in mind. The rewrite IO is very generous at this price point as well and definitely competes with the bigger boards out there. We're getting plenty of USB ports here, two 2.0 ports, eight 3.1 Gen 1 ports and two 3.1 Gen 2 ports with one of those being Type-C. Something that's also nice to see is that clear CMOS button at the rear which is super handy when your overclock does not go to plan. Now at the bottom right of the board we've got onboard power and reset buttons which are super convenient for testing and we've also got a dial for overclocking. This is just an onboard interface for MSI's OC Genie which you can find in their BIOS and you do need to enable it in the settings for it to work but I gotta say guys this did impress me especially when put to the task of overclocking the Threadripper 1950X. You can easily add a few hundred megahertz just by turning this dial which is really awesome and I'm not sure if I missed the memo here but the numbers do not make sense at all. We go from 0 to 1 to 2 then 4, 6, 8, 10 and then finally 11. 
So yeah, not really sure what's going on there, but the main thing is what this actually does to your CPU. So let's take a look at what those settings did with the 1950X. So with the dial set to zero, the auto overclocking was disabled and I wanted to see where the clock speeds were landing and where the voltage was at as well. And out of the box, we're sitting at 3.6 gigahertz for all 16 cores with the voltage bouncing around between 1.2 and 1.3 volts. Seeing as it is set to auto, it is a bit sporadic, but once we turn that OC dial onto the first notch, we actually bring that under control a little bit and gain some frequency as well. On level two, we do see quite a big jump in voltage for a small gain in frequency, but it does start to get pretty solid from here. And I was able to just keep turning that dial for those overclocking gains and voltage seemed to be pretty reasonable as well. And on the final notch, the 1950X lands us at 4.1 gigahertz on all cores at 1.42 volts. To have that many cores running that fast was absolutely mind blowing. And it's a bit of a personal record for me on Cinebench with a score of 3047. The ultimate test though was to see if I could run that 4.1 gigahertz overclock at a lower voltage. And to my surprise, I couldn't actually go much slower than what the auto overclocking was giving me and I only managed 1.4 volts for a few passes in Cinebench R15. Now cooling was a serious issue here as I didn't have any TR4 coolers with me at the time of this review so I took my chances with a 240mm liquid AIO and this was barely enough to cool the system even out of the box. So although I was able to reach a 4.1 gigahertz overclock, I wasn't able to fully test the stability in Prime 95 or Ida 64, as the temps were absolutely insane even after a minute. The Acer Tech pump block is nowhere near big enough to cover that enormous heat spreader and a dedicated TR4 cooler is definitely recommended. Luckily, I have one on the way. So reluctantly, I turned that dial back down to the first setting, taking us down to 3.75 gigahertz at 1.2 volts. And here we were able to get 10 minutes out of the system before the processor was getting too hot. This isn't any fault of the motherboard though, just that my cooler was nowhere near up to par. I'll drop a few links to the coolers that would do a much better job than this one in the description below. VRM temperatures though were in check and keep in mind this was with an open test bench with no active cooling. So realistically a typical system with active cooling, you'd see those temperatures drop down quite a bit. And so summing up, I'd be more than happy to run a Threadripper 1950X on this board and overclock it as well. It gives content creators and engineers a fully capable motherboard to work with without a lot of the extras that may not be needed. We've got a ton of USB connectivity, decent VRM phases with a functional heatsink, and all presented in a stealthy design. The auto OC through the dial is actually pretty useful with voltage levels that would rival a manual overclock. And I think this would be very useful for people who would just want a fast system out of the box without the trial and error of manual overclocking. As always though, I wanna hear what you guys have to say. Would this be your Threadripper match of choice or would you prefer to spend a little bit more money on the motherboard and less on the CPU? Don't forget to subscribe for similar content in the future and as always guys, I will see you all in the next one.